I'm Dustin Goes to Hollywood. I'm Mally Moore. And this is the Silver Linings Playlist, a podcast that tries to find the silver lining in some of cinema's most bleak endings. This is our third episode in our spooktacular Oktoberfest, whatever you want to call it, all horror-themed episodes uh, for the month of October. And by the title, you can tell that today's episode is probably one of the most iconic movies we're having, kind of a fucked up ending. Uh, it's 2007's The Mist. Uh, Mally, do you have anything you want to talk about before we start? Um, I mean, just the usual stuff. Uh, director, Frank Darabont. Surprisingly directed by Frank Darabont. I, I mean, is it, no, 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 not surprising at all. Well, it's not, an adaptation of a Stephen King movie. I meant surprising. Or a Stephen King book, and that's all Frank Darabont does. <laughs> I meant surprising in the fact that this movie's quality suffers greatly compared to The Green Mile or Shawshank Redemption. I'll tell you what it is. Hmm. It's the it's one of the only movies he's ever done that takes place in like modern times. I agree. I saw that. He, I saw that. He like exclusively does like period pieces for sure. Uh. So again, and kind of an appropriate movie since we had a hurricane last week. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, if you're new to the show, let us try to explain what this is. We take movies that have fucked up endings, that have downer endings, that have endings having you going, what the fuck? And we try to find the good try. in it. Yeah, we try. Try, try being a keyword. We fail a lot of the time. Uh, or we really, you know, get by on the skin of our teeth. But this movie has no exception, which we will get there when we get there. But if you look up any list on Google or whatever asking, what movie's got the most fucked up ending? Or this is always number towards one. the top. Yeah, it's oh, pretty yeah. much number one, like exclusively, uh, which made it perfect candidate for our horror themed October episodes. You know, yeah. Uh, this was like the first one we brought up pretty much when we started talking about doing the podcast alongside Buried. Yeah, uh, it, the, yeah, it was. was it was like this. Buried and then this. Yeah, for sure. So it's gonna be a good one. Uh, apologies if you if you failed. Like last week's was a little bit of a. A letdown in terms of episodes. It's definitely gonna be probably gonna be our shortest, but yeah. I mean, this, this mo- one, this one, we got I a got lot to talk about. Stuff to talk about. So, so let's get into it. This go. is again 2007's *The Mist*, directed by Frank Darabont, starring Thomas Jane, Marcia Gay Harden, Laurie, uh, uh, Laurie Holden, Andre. I think it's Brower. Is that how you pronounce it? Oh, that? I have no idea. Uh, you recognize him from some TV shows and stuff. Yeah, to- yeah. Uh, Toby Jones and William Sadler, aka. If you're a fan of The Walking Dead, it's the you're gonna love this movie because it's you're all, it's all your favorite Walking Dead characters in supporting roles. I was gonna say uh, when Frank Darabont did the pilot for Walking Dead, he wanted he wanted Thomas, Thomas Jane, Jane as yeah, Rick, ja- uh, Rick James as Rick. Rick Ro- <laughs> I want to watch that show. Much that would show. be amazing. Much better show. Hey. Uh, this movie had a budget of eighteen million dollars, which I feel is relatively low for a Darabont movie, but. Uh, it ended up grossing. Oh, yeah, until you see the CGI. Yeah, that's a good point. It's grossing uh, fifty-seven million dollars worldwide, and currently sits at a seventy-three percent on Rotten Tomatoes, which I feel like is. Huh. I think that number is only up there because of the ending. Oh yeah, no, th- this is kind of um, going back to our T three episode, mm-hmm. where the, the whole ending justifies the whole it. movie. I'm like, this is bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Oh shit, that ending though. Yeah, the ending justifies the ending it. Justifies 100%. Everything. So, uh, ending justifies everything. So let's listen to the trailer real quick and uh, get, catch you up to speed if you're not familiar. So bad. You just got it. Come, come on. Whoa. Having spoken, the doomsayer departs. <laughs> Why don't you get Billy dressed? I'll take him into town with him. Hit the store before it gets all bought out. How'd you folks hold up in the storm? Big insurance day. Sorry to hear that. What's going on? It's death. Shut the doors! Shut the doors! The only way we're gonna help ourselves is to seek rescue. You tie this around your waist? Or four. You let us know you got at least 300 feet. There's nothing out there. Nothing in the midst. What if you're wrong? Then I guess. The joke would be on me. It is time 
to take sides. Read the good book. It calls for blood. Guys, I hear something. Are those bugs? Not like any I've ever seen. The entire front of this store is plate glass. dimensions they wanted to try and make a window well maybe your window turned out to be a door who ah! she's gonna sacrifice to make it all better we want the boy you try it Kill him! Yeah! This trailer has some cheesy fucking effects, dude. And All some cheese. early 2000s text over over backgrounds. Of, they even put a little fog effect in there towards the beginning. It's like... Not not a great trailer. No, it's like not you're editing a on trailer. Movie Maker, like on a Windows XP computer. It's I mean, not on, great. On this budget, they might have, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there anything else you want to talk about before we get into the actual movie itself? Uh, No, let's get into it. Uh, so the first thing we get, where it's not even like an introduction, we don't even really get opening credits. Like, I mean, we do, but it's over visuals. We see yeah. our main character Thomas Jane. Uh, I don't remember what his actual character's name is, but uh, I apparently he's like a, a kind of the Drew Struzan, which is funny because of what's gonna happen. But he basically makes he paints posters for yeah. movies, uh, and the poster he's painting is actually uh, kind of a nod to the Dark Tower series, which is also another Stephen King uh, series. But the the painting that is actually in this shot was actually painted by Drew Struzan, which is kind of like a all comes full circle kind of thing. Uh, and there's also a little bit of an Easter egg. We have a poster from The Thing yep. uh, right there on his wall. Watch. I don't know if Drew Struzan did that one or not. Uh, I'm not sure, actually. I probably should know that. However, uh, yeah, our character is kind of painting uh, this poster. It's a dark, stormy night, and a, a tree comes through uh, through his window like a tree branch. Uh, and we cut to the next morning and we're seeing all this damage that the storm caused. And of course, we're in Maine because it's Stephen King, which, uh, of actually course. they filmed in Louisiana and Stephen King couldn't tell the difference, which, haha. Uh, <laughs> got him. So yeah, uh, this is the second time, uh, that Thomas Jane plays a character where he loses his family, <laughs> which we'll get into when we get there. Yeah. But uh, if you've seen the That's Punisher, typecasting, man. You, if you've seen the Punisher, you know what we're talking about. Uh, so this, yeah, they come out, uh, they recognize all this, this, uh, wreckage that's occurred. Uh, this tree, uh, landed on, I don't know if the tree was on Thomas Jane's house and it yeah, landed on his so neighbor's. It was his, it was his neighbor's tree fell onto his boathouse. His boathouse. So <clears throat> he goes next door. Uh, he, first world problems, man. Yeah, for sure. He goes oh, next tree door. Fell on my boathouse. And he meets up with, uh, this character Norton, who's his neighbor. And apparently they don't really get along that well. Okay, this is my thing. <clears throat> So they just lived through a pretty horrible storm. Mm -hmm. So they're going to the store to buy supplies Mm -hmm. and food. Mm -hmm. Aren't you supposed to do that before the storm, not the morning after? Does Maine really get that bad of storms? I mean, they're on the coast, but they're pretty freaking north. I don't know. Uh, Anyways, the character, uh, Thomas Shane goes next door. I hear you. I hear you. I just don't get it. No, I agree. Uh, uh, he goes next door and he says, you know, we should probably exchange insurance information since your tree hit my house. Uh, and it, we get this feeling that they, these two don't really get along well yeah. or have it in the past. But there, there's uh, some history there. Yeah. Thomas Jane's like, I'm going to go into town. And uh, Norton's like, what well, can I come with? So the two load up in, their, in uh, his station wagon and they take uh, Thomas Jane. We hate son. each other. Road trip. Yeah, basically. They take their son, his son as well. And as they're going into town, they're passing by military vehicles. They're going the opposite direction. Kind of just like, oh, I wonder what that's about. Uh, this movie's got some odd editing. And maybe it's just me. Yeah, no. But there's something on this movie. I can't quite put my finger on it. But it's just... I, I know there's really not not much music. Uh, there's, there's a lot of like handheld following shots. There's a lot of zooms in here and there. And a lot of cuts that just well, don't seem to belong. And yeah, I, don't know, I feel like... Every single shot either gets cut too early or goes on for too long. Yeah. And, and again, yeah, the there's zooms, those weird zooms. This just every... makes it weird. Yeah. Yeah. 
Especially, um, like, there's one, like, and we'll get to it later. It's during one of the monster shots. Mm-hmm. It just, it's a horrible zoom in. Yeah. And it bothers me every time. Also, fuck yeah, Toby Jones. Oh, yeah, Toby Jones. We'll get there, but Toby Jones is the is the OG of this movie. Oh, yes. Uh, so, yeah, I gotta say also... <clears throat> They, they they pull up to this grocery store and Thomas Shane gets out of the tr- out of the station wagon with his son, um, and his son's like you know dad. Which first of all he calls him daddy, which I feel like this kid is way too old to be doing that. Uh, yeah, what do you say this kid is? Maybe what nine, ten? He's pr- he's at least nine. Uh, he's like, can I go into the store? And uh, he's Thomas Shane says, yeah, if, as long as you hold Norton's hand. Mm-hmm. Which again, this kid's also too old to be holding hands, like. This kid is able to walk and talk and complete sentences and everything. They're in the parking lot. He's at least nine. This kid's gonna be hitting puberty soon, and he's you know he's got this like baby face, blue eyed like daddy kind of look to him. It's just really awkward and makes me uncomfortable. And okay. maybe and is that's it just was... me, or is this one of the worst lit movies I've ever seen? No, it's you. It's like random hot spots and wait, what do you mean it's me? It, no, I, no, it's it's you. Uh, oh. <laughs> It's just random hot spots and everything. It's just it looks odd. There's these zooms again with this with these military yep. characters. But anyways, also, I kept a tally of every Walking Dead character. There's like three or four. That's our first one, Andrea, right there. Yeah, well, uh, not her. But. These military police come in, and we get the idea that one of these uh, these soldiers uh, is having a fling with one of the cashiers there, who is actually the babysitter for Thomas Jane's character mm-hmm. for his son. And that soldier's the creepiest looking yeah, dude he is, ever. He God, just the looks face. weird. Yeah. And it took me forever to realize what I recognized him from. Mm-hmm. Did you ever play Force Unleashed? No. Is he based off he, the... the they he did the motion capture. Yeah, yeah. I know I know the character for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um so yeah. Another zoom. Yeah, there's just there's random zooms, zooms all over this movie. So they're in the grocery store, they're getting ready to check out. Change a bunch of people are in the there. Zoom. Yeah, a bunch of people are in the store buying groceries and stuff. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, we hear this siren, the, that Silent Hill kind of siren that kicks in. Yep. And we see this character uh, rushing inside from the parking lot of the store, and he's Walking covered in blood. Walking Dead character number two, Dale. Yep, Dale starts running into the store. He's covered in blood. And so funny, that, like, maybe it's just me again, but did you notice this? He's running inside, and, like, he's looking back. He's not screaming or anything. He's just kind of running inside, and everyone's watching him from inside the store. And there's no, like, nobody's talking. Everyone's just kind of watching. And then as soon as he gets in the store, he just starts screaming. It's like a Monty Something's Python thing. Something's in the mist. Something's yeah. in the mist. It's like a Monty Python thing where, like, you see the editing of, like, the guy way back right. in the hill. And then they cut in the next shot and all of a sudden he's right there uh-huh. with everyone else. It's just, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But that's what I mean by odd editing in this movie. So, anyways, the the, the fog starts rolling in and the store starts trembling and shaking. They can't Which, see out. I love that. They're like, what is it? What is it? One character is like, it's death, immediate earthquake. Yep. Uh, so one of these characters is like, you know, this this random dude is like, I'm going to run outside. I can make it to my car. And he runs outside. And I got to say, this dude has got like the, a handlebar mustache. And he's got an El Camino that's on dubs, which is awesome. Not something I would expect this character to drive at all. And it definitely stuck out to me. Um, so he... We don't really see what happens to him. We just kind of hear that yeah. he gets like ripped apart and out in the mist because this mist is really thick and you can't really see out of it. Uh, and then you get your other, you get your third character from The Walking yep, Dead, number Melissa three, McBride, Carol, plays Carol. She's literally credited as woman with kids at home, and the reason she is is because she is a woman with kids at home. Yes, and she even says it. She's like, you know, I have kids at home. I've got to get to them. Uh, will anybody help me? And everyone says no. So she starts doing that Carol thing where she starts crying and she walks outside and disappears into the mist and we don't ever see her again. Uh, so they're they're kind of held up in the store and they're in the aisle. Thomas Shane's holding his son and his son is again, his son's like nine years old and he's like, yeah, he's he hasn't sucked his thumb since he was two years old and he's doing it now. Okay, this was a long time ago, but you were nine at one point, right? No. Okay, well you were ten. No. Nah. Eight. Nope. Okay. Well, I was I was nine at one point. I wasn't sucking my thumb then. <laughs> uh, I feel like oh, they dude, met. I was out for, doing like rad shit. I feel like they meant for this character to be a lot younger, and then they just ended up casting this guy, this kid. 
Because this kid, again, it's just uncomfortable and weird. Because this kid is not. Yeah, like he's way too old to be like acting. And I mean, Save Twill, maybe he's he like, like a five year old. Maybe he's like devolving because they're going through a traumatic experience. I don't But even give before a shit. that, when at the beginning of the movie, he was doing the daddy. Oh, yeah, good the, point. Yeah, the smiling and holding hands. Yeah, and stuff. like maybe it was like written for like a five year old or something. But I don't know. No, I agree. So, they're, yeah, they're held up in the store, and uh, Norton is, like, talking to some people, and it looks like he's, like, forming a group, but Thomas Shane goes in the back because uh, they're getting, like, a generator started up for something. I don't know. Or they're checking on the generator or something like that? I don't know what he's I don't doing know. back they're there. They're going back there for yeah. some reason. So, he goes back there, and hears a sound, and, like, there's the rolling shutter for, like, where they deliver food and everything. It starts. There's, like, a banging on it. Uh, he runs up and tells a few people, you know, hey, there's a sound back here. Someone come help. And uh, a few people go back there, one of which is this kind of redneck dude. I don't think we ever get – I don't know his name. I'm sure they give his name, but I don't know who he is. He comes back there, and he starts mocking him. He's like – and he's like, you know, you probably heard something, but I don't see anything. And he – it's this weird thing where in horror movies, you always have to have someone kind of like bullying another person yep. with the weirdest insults because – Thomas Shane's like, look, I know what I heard. You know, there's definitely something out there. You shouldn't. What, the, what their plan is, is they got to go outside to restart the generator or something like that, right? So they got to roll up the shutter to get out there. And Thomas Shane's pleading with them not to. But the guy is just like, you know, look, I understand you've got connections in Hollywood, whatever, but I don't like being talked down to. And he's not talking down to him at all. No, not in he's the just saying, He's saying, hey, guys, probably shouldn't, you know, open that shutter. Again, it's just they have to form like this synthetic kind of weird like rivalry between these two characters, and it's just weird to me. But anyways, one of the characters, uh, one of the pe- one of the guys back there decides he's going to volunteer to be the one that goes outside, and it's none other than the Shermanator. Oh yeah, from American Pie. Shout out. Yeah, so he's like, you know, I can do it. I'll go outside. So they roll the shutter up, and when you know it. A huge fucking hentai tentacle starts wrapping around his leg and starts pulling him under. Horrible CGI I've ever seen. I don't know where the budget for this movie went to, but it certainly did not go to post because these... Oh, the CG is so bad. Is it me or... Does no one react? Yep. Nope. That's that's one of my notes in here. Anything. That big CGI tentacle. No one reacts to anything in this movie. But I'm going to get there. I would be flipping shit and they're just like... Huh. Yeah, they're just kind of looking at it. No, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. But I want to say about the CG. Do you remember, like, in the early 90s when we started first getting CG? Or, like, up to, the up to like, the end of the 90s. Like, everything was really glossy. Like, all the yeah, CG yeah, yeah. was very glossy and everything. This CG is right on the cusp of it where, like, it's glossy, but it still has, like, like the shadows, the harsh shadows and everything. Mm-hmm. Where it's, it's right in the line between good CG and bad CG, but it's still bad. It's like yeah, it's bad. I'd rather it be so bad that it's bad, but this is somehow makes it worse. Uh, we get these tentacles that, that come in and start wrapping around the Shermanator's leg and starts to drag him under. And although my favorite part of the movie does take place during this scene, yeah, was that one of the other tentacles is like in the ground blocking the way, and Toby Jones <laughs> does that great Olympic jump it's over like it, a foot off the ground. <laughs> yeah, and he like he runs towards it. Stops. He's like, oh, pumps boy. himself up. He's like, yep. all right, I can do this, and just hops over it. <laughs> Favorite scene of the so, movie by far. This the, the cool the one cool shot in this scene though is as one of the tentacles has uh, the Shermanator wrapped around the leg. Thomas Shane's trying to pull him up and save him. Another tentacle comes in and kind of like lays itself on his chest, and it's filled with spikes and rips away and like tears off yeah. his like chest, which is pretty rad. Uh, oh, was, this movie's got some gore. It's got some pretty it's cool deaths got in it. Some gore, pretty cool deaths in it. But for some reason, I don't know what this shot's supposed to entail. But another tentacle comes in, and they start. It starts eating dog food. Like it picks yeah, up the dog food bag and crushes it. And like, I don't know what this scene's supposed to tell me, but I guess it likes dog food. Well, anyways, uh, Shermanator gets drug to hell <laughs> uh, out of the shutters, where Toby Jones almost fucking decapitates him. Uh, they managed to cut off yeah. one of the tentacles. Norm gets fucked up. Who's Norm? Is that is that, that the, that's the Shermanator? That's the Shermanator. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I thought you were saying that's the redneck dude because I don't know the redneck dudes. Yeah, no, Shermanator gets fucked. Uh, so he's dead. He gets drugged out into the mist. We don't see him again. And uh, to your point, that is my next note: is that no one reacts in this movie because there's the shot of the the tentacle grabbing the dog food, 
And it's like huge bulking mammoth thing. And the, the, the two redneck dudes are just looking at it like, huh, there's that. No one's screaming. No one's reacting. No. Everyone's just kind of like, well, that's happening. And that happens a lot throughout this movie. And that's maybe another reason why I think the editing is just weird. Because one thing Frank Darabont's great at is fucking characters. Like, if you've seen Shawshank and Green Mile. Oh, yeah, for sure. And that's something this movie lacks is you don't really care about anybody. Like, at least not on the positive side. Maybe Not Thomas really. Shane's character, but yeah, or, you, I mean, the only one I gravitate to is Toby Jones. Like that dude is oh, straight yeah. up OG he's a in this movie. Boss. So they lose to Sherman, and they're like, "Okay, we got to go outside. We got to tell these people what happened." And so they're like, "Well, what are we going to tell them?" They go to to Norton, and they're like, "Look, dude, something happened back there. Uh, the Shermanator got drug off. He's dead. There's a tentacle back there. Come look at it." And he's like, no, he thinks he's being pranked, which, what's the worst case scenario? He goes back there. He even says, he's like, I go back there, I, I, you point a, I, you show me a rubber snake and everybody laughs at me. Well, is it really that hard? Like, if they're already telling you in advance. That's, that's a horrible thing. prank, by the way. Like, yeah. Too. Like, just what the hell? But even if you know, even if it was a prank and that is what they were going to do and you knew about it in advance, it makes it not funny and it makes you know what you're going into. And he just refuses. He's like, no, I'm not going to go in. And Thomas Shane starts trying to drag him. Like, come look at this thing so you'll believe me. And they have an altercation. And this is where kind of the story splits off. Where some people are going with Norton. Some people are staying mm-hmm. with Thomas Jane. And the, we get this introduced. I mean, we're already introduced to her. But really get introduced <sighs> to psycho this Jesus crazy. Lady. I'm just going to call her the crazy woman because I don't know her. All right, fair enough. Name. Uh, she's praying under a desk in a bathroom to God, but like, not so praying, more like having a conversation where she's like, look, I'm a good person, right? You should spare me. I understand. She believes that this is the end of days and she's touting it to all these people like this is judgment day or whatever. We're all going to be judged by God, whatever. And that one dude gets pissed about her talking. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, Andrea, again from Walking Dead, cause I don't know her character's name in here. She comes in. Uh, and she notices the woman praying under the desk, and she's like, you know, I just wanted to use the bathroom. And the woman's like, whatever. And she starts walking out, and Andrea's like, you know, look, if you need a friend or anything, I'm here to talk. <laughs> and the crazy lady gives a pretty great reaction line. It's, uh, if I wanted a friend like you, I'd have myself a little squat, and shit went out. <laughs> that is. That's pretty great. Like, can't even just... argue with that one. Uh, Burn. So it comes out, uh, they, everyone kind of regroups in the store. Uh, Norton said, saying, you know what, I don't know what you think is out there, but we're going out in the mist. And Thomas Jane's trying to convince him not to. And they're having this argument back and forth that's kind of dividing the store. And then this is where the religious debates come in. This is where the the crazy woman's like spouting off again, like how this is because of this and this. This is why this is happening, because of God, whatever. And Andrea just starts to bitch slaps her <laughs> to try and get her to shut oh, yeah. up. And so again, the group is just split down the middle. And Norton's group decides they're going to leave. Uh, he says, you know, to Thomas Shane's character, I don't know what you think is out there, but it's not supernatural or whatever. Which is what Thomas Shane's starting to think it is because he's seen the tentacle. This is about the point in the movie where I took a break and got some cereal. Okay. This part of the movie gets really <laughs> boring. I'm sorry. Where they're having their debates and everything. It's just like 15 minutes of them talking. Well, it's a Stephen King movie. you got to have some That's debate true. about God in it. Uh, so they start boarding up the windows with dog food and everything else, and Norton's like, you know what, we're leaving. And Thomas Shane co- tries to convince him, look, if you're going to go out there, at least tie this rope around your waist, and that way we know however far you get, it, you, you'll at least get 300 feet, because that's how long the rope is. Yeah. We'll know. And he says he's not going to do it. He says, if I'm not coming back, then you know the joke was on me. So there's this biker dude who, hated, who hates this fucking religious lady. Uh... He's like, you know what? I'll do it. I'll tie the rope around me. We'll go out there and, you know. So <laughs> they start exiting the, the the grocery store and everyone seems fine. Norton's yeah. group seems fine. Uh, Thomas Shane has a bunch of people behind him and they're slowly letting the Holding rope go rope. and try to see. And all of a sudden the rope just snags and starts pulling it. Like you can hear like it peeling its skin off because it's going so fast. Uh, oh, wait, we skipped over the crocodile Dundee scene. I missed that. What is that? Uh, all right. OG Ollie at one point, right uh-huh. before the biker leaves, tries to walk up and hand him a knife. Mm-hmm. And the biker just pulls out a huge fucking oh, bowie yeah, knife. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I just, in my head, you know the line. Just, oh, that's not a knife. Yeah, yeah. This is a knife. <laughs> so 
the rope just starts getting pulled faster and faster, and they can't see what's going on there because it's the mist, you know. And Credits. That's gonna be my yeah. That's gonna be my my return to for now because of the mist. You know? <laughs> so they finally start manage to get uh, up some slack on. They start pulling it back in. They start pulling the rope, rope pulling the pulling pulling. They hear screams and terror and everything outside. And all of a sudden, it the just rope becomes this epic tug of war. Really. Yeah, all of a sudden, this white clean rope just starts becoming blood drenched as he's yep. pulling it in, pulling it in. Everyone's screaming in horror. And Thomas Shane just looks confused. He's not reacted to anything. He's just like, what? Kind of how this? he looks this entire movie, to be honest. So, uh, he pulls the, the, the rope back in and attached to the other end of it is half of the, just the biker. Just the dude's so legs. Just bottom legs, yep. And everyone starts losing their minds. So they start boarding up, uh, the, the, uh, the grocery store again. And we, I got to say, after this, we never see Norton or the rest of his group after this. No. You're led Never. to speculate whether he made it out or not, which we'll talk about that at the end. But they start loading up the, the store. They start kind of doing like the Home Alone thing, like setting traps or like getting ready for some shit to go down. They start putting out mop buckets full of gasoline and mops in it, where that way they can kind of make like torches and everything. Uh, and night comes and he's like huge flying locust all things. Just big ass house flies. Just start like kind of like like fluttering up to the glass of the of the store and while this is all going on in the back of the store the babysitter character and the soldiers started like kissing and flirting and i guess they've had a relationship kind of going on um and then uh the these giant like pterodactyl bird things start like attacking the flying locusts and which because this this store has nothing but glass pane windows all in the front of it they burst through the doors. They turns out they're attracted to the lights. So they try and turn off all the lights, but it doesn't work. Yeah, like at one point, okay, so you have some people saying, turn on the lights, they're in the store. Because that was their plan. Once they got, if something got in the store, they were going to turn the lights on so they could fight them off and see. Yeah. But at the same time, other people are realizing they're attracted to the lights. So you have literally one group yelling, <laughs> yep. turn on the lights. One group yelling, turn off the lights. Mm -hmm. They there's not communicate where the shit. There's shit. literally one guy that's like, "Do you want the lights on or off?" He ain't, and that's actually a line. That's literally movie. a line of dialogue. Yeah. Wait, 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 do we want lights on or off, guys? Yeah. So these insects start getting in the store, and they immediately sting this babysitter girl in the neck. And these these things are huge. They're like the size of like small dogs. Oh yeah, for sure. It's like a flying uh, chihuahua. With and the stinger six itself layers. is probably at least a foot long, maybe not, maybe longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it stings her right in the neck, and her neck starts just swelling up. Swelling. Uh, it's so it's like a football. It's like an under extra neck on your neck. <laughs> so the soldier dude starts freaking out, trying she to help her. She starts looking like a bodybuilder, pretty much. Most, yeah, like where her neck From starts like, under ears. Neck up. Yeah. And so these insect things are all in the store, and Thomas Shane's beating them off with a broom, with a broom handle. Uh, I think it's funny because. Like, this guy goes, this random character goes to ignite one of the mops, lights it on fire, spills the bucket, immediately lights himself and the rest of the store on fire. Yeah, like, that this, dude the had first no mop they lit, <laughs> and the store goes up in flames. Um, as this is yeah, all the going whole mop on. thing really backfired really quick. <laughs> literally, backfired. Uh, uh, as, as this, like, whole devastation shit's going on. We should have mentioned that Andrea had a gun in her purse, and Toby has now taken over ownership of it. And he does, I don't think he misses, he made me miss this one shot this whole movie. Yeah, and he I is mean, a straight marksman. He, it takes him a minute to get that first shot off, but once he gets that first he's, shot, he's he just goes to town. So, uh, all, while well, all this, like, crazy panic is going on in the store, people are fighting these insects or trying to shoot them, uh, one of these bugs flies up to the crazy lady and she kind of like starts like surrendering herself. Like kind of like that idea of like if you don't move for a wasp, it won't hurt you kind of thing. And Which is some up, bullshit. That does not work. No. And it ends up sparing her and she starts thinking, oh, this is because, you know, Jesus, like, Jesus, pretty much. Um, so after all this devastation, they managed to get all the insects killed, which is funny because you had this one shot of just Thomas Jane beating this puppet to death. It, it's clearly dead. It's a solid 20 seconds. Of this dead ass bug, mm -hmm. and Thomas Jane hitting it with a stick. Yep. So they manage to get all these bugs out and kill all the ones that are in there, and they block off the windows again. Uh, after o OG Ollie ends up getting another headshot on one of these things. Uh, so they're like trying to prepare a plan. They're like, what are we going to do? 
Uh, and while that's going on, they make a comment that this old, this crazy lady is basically becoming the Jim Jones of the, of the store. She's convinced <laughs> a lot of people that this is like the, you know, plagues and this is the end of days kind of thing. Like she's been doing this whole movie. She's convinced even more and more people. Well, Thomas Jane's like, you know what? We're right next door to a pharmacy. We can go and try to get some antibiotics to try and help some of the people that were attacked. And, uh, they, they, they go with a very small group. And when they go next door, uh, they find that, uh, this MP, uh, has been like cocooned in the store. And a lot of people have been cocooned in there, basically kind of like spider webs. But they've also been like this scene is gross. You remember that scene in the Mummy where there's like bugs that are under the skin? Yeah, uh, mm, mm. it's like that, but oh, like times a thousand. So like it's like scabies on acid. Yeah, like it's kind of like an alien where they use them as like uh, as incubuses, like or incubators. Yeah, like for for yeah. their other spawn. Yeah, so this dude's body like explodes. Like I said, this movie's got some gore. Yeah, no, it's got some really cool say. scenes. Like it's, this dude's chest explodes and all these bugs escape. Uh, a few people die. It's not really anything special. They get the medicine. Uh, this old lady that's been a part of this movie makes this badass fucking torch. Like, lights this bug on fire with an aerosol can and a, a lighter. Uh, there's, like I said, there's just a bunch of people cocooned in this, in this pharmacy. And it's just like a death, death trap, this place. So, they get the antibiotics and they go back. And, uh, apparently while they were gone, uh, this lady has convinced these people... Uh, that they need to basically start uh, recognizing that they have to that do uh, what's called expiation, which I never heard of this word until this. But basically, it's just yeah, like repenting for your me. sins, kind of. Um, and it's like because of all the shit that's going on now, this redneck dude that uh, Tom Shane had an encounter with earlier, he went to the pharmacy. He saw the shit. He is now completely convinced. He, he is, is completely on converted. his knees, hands together, bowed, praying he's like, "Yes, Jesus, I'm so sorry, Hallelujah," that kind of thing. And it's completely on this woman's side. He is completely flipped. Well, uh, they go... Thomas Jane takes the soldier guy that was in love with the babysitter, takes him in the back where two of his fellow office, uh, fellow soldiers have hung themselves uh, because they're like, fuck this, we're out. They take him in the back and they're like, well, look, we need to tell us because you obviously know something that's going on here. Well, turns out there was this thing called Project Arrow where... If you've ever played the Half Life games, which we'll get into that too, yeah, that's what that's based on. Is like they open a portal to another world by mistake, and all these things come out of it, and that's what Project Arrow is. And uh, the Red Dead dude probably pretty much drags this dude out and like makes him tell everybody what's going on. And this this crazy lady is again leading this fucking rebellion, uh, and she calls for this man to basically be like, well, I don't know, if she actually does herself, or if the crowd kind of does it, but. She's blaming this guy. It's kind she, of a combination of the two. Yeah, she's kind of like, without saying it, saying that we should kill this guy. Yeah. Because she's like, you know, he's like, we didn't mean to do this. We meant to try and create a window. Like, this is one of the more, this is one of the more fucked up scenes yeah. to me in the movie. Most definitely. Like, one of the most fucked up deaths, for sure. And she's like, you know, well, maybe that window became a door. And, like, her crazy freaking, like, followers now, like, started attacking this guy. And one guy just straight up just starts stabbing just walks him. walks up to him and just starts... Just right again, in the stomach. In the, it's the opposite of the strangers, where like those were slow, just kind of like nonchalant deaths. This dude is like prison shaking him in the gut. But it's like this dude has the most horrifying reaction shots, where he's realizing he's being stabbed. And he's not like crying or yelling. He's got like these guttural kind of sounds, like of pain, and it's it's hard to watch for sure. No, no, I especially, completely agree. Especially on the basis of why he's being you know attacked. And there's this pr- really cool shot. I have to give this movie this. Is well, and the worst part, he's like, you know, it's not like I was just stationed there. Like I yeah. wasn't the one doing it. Yeah. And they're like, uh, don't care. But yeah, there's a knife. This woman start the crazy woman before he starts getting stabbed. Kind of like drugging on. Like the reason this is all happening is because we have abortions and we have babies out of wedlock and all this. Basically, the Bible toting like yeah agenda the usual stuff. But I have this really they have this really cool shot where like as after this dude's been stabbed. She's convinced him. She's like, throw him outside. Basically, use him as a sacrifice. Feed him to the beast, I believe is her exact oh, words. Oh, Jesus. So, like, they do, like, a crowd surfing thing where this dude is holding his gut, holding his fucking guts in, and is he's bleeding screaming. out. Screaming. And they're just, like, crowd surfing him all the way to the front door, and they just throw him out. It's such a fucking horrifying shot, dude. Like, you know if the r- rapture ever does happen, this is what's going to happen for some people, and it's just, ugh. 
Uh, that shit's terrifying, dude. Like, the Bible Belt is the most horrible. Like, Red State is the most scary oh. movie to me. Oh, right. So, uh, they t- toss him outside, and yeah, he gets he gets taken away. We don't really get to see. that handprint on the window yeah that bloody handprint yeah we don't really get to see exactly what takes him but he gets taken away and this is we this has already happened a few times but this is one of the few few times that this movie fades to black which happens a lot i noticed that Mm -hmm. when i watched it earlier a lot so like kind of gives hard candy a run for its money on those fade to blacks yeah, yeah. yeah for sure I think Hard Candy was cut to black, so maybe this one's kind of like they're neck and neck uh, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> in different yeah. categories. But it's the next morning, and Thomas Jane's character's like, you know what? Fuck this. I have had enough of this shit. And him and a handful of people are like, we're going to leave. And the crazy lady is blocking the exit, and she starts doing her Jim Jones thing, trying to rile people up. And it's so great, because as she's in the middle of it, she basically says, we want... Your son, talking about Thomas Saint Jane's son, we're like, yeah. we want him to give to the to the beast outside to kind of like maybe appease it. So as she's doing her little rant, she's had this bottle of milk that she's drinking, and she gets shot in the chest, like in the stomach, right through the like bottle through, of milk. The bullet goes through the glass of milk into her chest. Mm-hmm. By who? OG Ollie boy. coming through in the clutch. <laughs> And not only that, she draws to her stomach and he gets a fucking headshot, like dead oh, center mass. Oh, just pops her right in the face. And it's so great because this is what you've been wanting you this whole movie. You get smoking gun shot oh, of yeah. him too. You've wanted this this whole movie. Like, even if you specifically didn't, all the people in this movie did. They definitely wanted to put a bullet in this woman's head. And everyone lets, they let him leave. So, yeah, because uh, they're like, oh shit, Ollie's real. It's Thomas Jane, his son, Ollie... Andrea from The Walking Dead, the old lady, and Dale, and uh, one other character too, I believe. Uh, yeah, I think it's the, the, actual, the handlebar mustache I think it's, guy. Well, and I think it isn't the owner of the grocery store there too. Yes, at I think, first. So they decide that they they exit the store and they're gonna make a run for for because uh, they Tom start Shane's out I think, car. So counting the son, I think there's originally seven of them. Yeah, I think the grocery store leave. owner gets taken out immediately. After oh yeah, stepping yeah. Outside. Um, so they make a run for the car. Uh, Ollie, unfortunately, gets taken up by this huge yeah. crab thing. All, like, he has, this is, he gets that Bane death. Yeah. Like, he's a badass throughout the whole movie. And then the and death then is just kind of... goes out like a bitch. Yeah, like, it cuts his whole fucking arm off and, like, drops the gun on the hood of Thomas Jane's car. Uh, the biker dude gets taken out, too, by some bugs. Uh, so, basically... Uh, Thomas Jane, his son, Andrea, uh, the old woman, and Dale make it to their car. Yep. And they start driving away. They, it's it's uh it's kind of cool because it's like this song kicks in, which is like the theme song of the movie, uh, which is a fucking <laughs> awesome song. Oh, completely agree. Uh, it's by a band called Dead Can Dance, and the name of the song is The Host of Seraphim. Shit. Uh, it's a fucking operatic, cool ass fucking. My song. favorite part of them leaving is that. Before they leave on their adventure out to the mist, they drive. <laughs> they like slow, like pimp ride by the grocery store, just like and everyone's looking at them like, God damn it! Uh, so yeah, they drive by, and this there's really it's kind of convenient. There's really no nothing that happens to them on their drive. They, they you know, Thomas Chain's mm-hmm. like, we gotta go back for my wife. So as they drive, there's no bugs, nothing attacks them. I guess being inside. A closed, confined space is pretty much the your safe bet. Yeah. So Thomas Jane drives all the way back, which is gotta be hard to drive in that fucking mess, dude. Drives all the way back to his house and finds out that his wife has been dead this whole time. She, yeah, she's cocooned. Cocooned right up on the side of the house, which downer ending already for that. But yeah, the sure. shot is fucking cool. It's like almost like that lady in the water poster, like the pale skin woman. Yeah, like it yeah, looks really yeah. cool. Um. So. I don't, they're just like, you know what, we're just going to drive this car as far as we can, see if we can go one direction, see if we can get uh, outrun the mist, pretty much. So they start driving through, and they're driving slow and just observing all the carnage around. They drive by a school bus and with a bunch of dead children yeah. in it, which is kind of even... They go places you don't normally expect horror movies to go, for sure. Um, so in, as they're driving, the kid's kind of in, a, in uh, Andrea's lap asleep. She's kind yeah, of like combing his hair, seat. trying to confront him, yeah, so he's asleep. Trying to confront him? I think she's trying to console him. Like, oh, confront him. I'm sorry. Can console him is what I'm there about to say. Go. 
Comfort. Yeah, comfort. Uh, you're gonna get there eventually. Yeah, and I gotta say, apparently this is a key scene in the in the book. But uh, as they're driving, they they come to a halt because they see something, and this is basically Cthulhu, as far as I'm concerned. It's this <laughs> giant fucking crab thing that's got tentacles coming out of it, and it's, it's just fucking huge. Like, it's so big that birds are circling it. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's yeah. ma- and it doesn't interfere with them at all. It just kind of just walking by. I, I, that's the Jurassic Park shot. Yeah. Like when they first see the yeah, yeah, yeah. For dinosaur sure. in Jurassic Park. Yeah. <clears throat> all right, guys. This is it. We've got... Oh, we've man. arrived. So We're here's here. the situation. Let We're me, here. Let me recap. Paint them a picture. They've escaped the grocery store. It's, again, Thomas Jane, his son, Andrea, this old lady, and Dale. Five of them in this car. They have uh, Andrea's gun that Olive is using, uh, and like I said, they're driving this car. They're like, we'll go as far as we can, uh, to see if we can get out of the mist, and the car just runs out of gasoline, and they're just kind of sitting here in the vast nothingness, and they're like, you know what? This kind of this unspoken thing that, that happens between the characters, uh, Thomas Jane pulls out the gun and realizes there's only four bullets, but there's five of them. And so, without saying it, really, they kind of, like, agreed, like, okay, uh, we're just going to commit suicide. But you're going to do it. You're, it's voluntary homicide, yeah. basically. Thomas, he's like, Thomas, you're going to kill all of us. Uh, and keep in mind that oh, the kid's man. asleep during all this. So, he's counting the bullets. He's rolling around in his hand. And everyone's, like, kind of, like, in terror. They're like, you know, this is the best option. Rather than yeah. go out and be fucking torn asunder by <laughs> the fucking hell beast. God. So Thomas Shane starts loading up the revolver, and as soon as he does that, wouldn't you know it, his son happens to wake up. Of course. Uh, and then it ah. cuts to that, it's that little pan out of the car, and you just hear, pop, 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 pop. Yep. It, this is the best way to do this, I think. Rather than showing anybody die, it's so tastefully done. We just get this low-angle, wide shot of the, of the station wagon, and uh, amongst all the mist... You just see the muzzle flashes in the yes. car along with the pops. Like, and, okay, I'll be honest. I, pre- I, I I don't like the cinematography in this movie at all. I, I do like that, though. Up until this scene. This yeah. entire scene. Beautiful. Beautiful. You could make a, a short film out of this last scene. Like, oh, it's, yeah. It's, it is, a short, oh, it is a short film in and of itself. Like, you just show the station wagon pull up. You don't even have to give backstory. You just no. fucking... Like, there's kind of a full three acts in this, like, two-minute scene. Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, so, he shoots his son, he shoots Andrea, he shoots uh, the old lady, and he shoots Dale. And it cuts back in, and he's just having... He, he's Do you ever lo- he's, wonder what order he did it in? I would think he shoots the son first. Right? Get out of the way. Do You don't want him to see what you're about to do. Uh, I think you saved the old... I don't know. You saved Dale for last, right? I think so. I think you shoot Andrea I would, I would next. Go son, Andrea, old lady, Dale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, then... God, or do you, you think he did Andrea last? I think he might have, because while he is married... She would have to hold the dead kid the whole time? It's pretty quick, though, man. It's like five seconds and he shoots all of them. I don't care. I mean, I think they you, they kind of hint... fucked up. They kind of hint that there's kind of like a relationship kind of brewing yeah, between kinda. the two. So maybe he shoots Andrea last, but I don't know. But um, yeah, then it just cuts to him just losing in the car, his mind, just screaming. Yeah, like, and puts he's the like, gun in his mouth and tries, and it's out. You know, nothing like, obviously happens. Hit it in the steering wheel, and he's like, "Fuck it, I'm gonna go out. I'm I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna be the one that gets. Yeah. Rather than puts a bullet in my brain, I'll let the 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 mist take me. So he gets out of the car and he's just like, you know, threatening him, like, "Come on, come take me," you know, that kind of macho thing and. Do you want to say what happens? The mist starts to dissipate. <laughs> and out of the mist comes a fucking tank. Followed by an entire military <laughs> convoy. So, And in the first truck is none other than... Than the woman with kids at home, <laughs> who smiles at him as they drive. So by. Let me let me let me tell you. This is like as this happens, you can't think of nothing but womp womp. Like this is 
literally, if he would have waited less than a minute longer, they would have been okay. So, again, he gets out of the car. He's sitting there shouting at the mask, you know, come take me, whatever. And he starts to hear this noise. And, again, this tank just slowly rides through. And there's these guys with flamethrowers, these soldiers with assault rifles and everything. They're just kind of looking at him. They just roll right past him. And you see another guy with a flamethrower burning other cocoons and stuff. And, again, the mist just kind of rolls away. Yeah. And he's just looking in, like, confusion. Like, what is happening? And then, again, like Mally said, this... Truck rides by full with uh, with uh, people they've rescued, and one of them is the woman with kids. Uh, she just kind of looks at him. And... Fuck you, Carol. <laughs> the best <sighs> man, uh, and he just has a breakdown. And again, as he's doing it, this song kicks back in. The host of Seraphim just kicks back in, and like these two soldiers just kind of looking at him, like, dude, like, ah. Uh, I'll yeah, he it. just starts lo- <laughs> he just starts losing it all over again, and that's it. Fade to black. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, Movie that's over. there's nothing else after that. Uh, I'm gonna put this to you: best horror ending ever. Best uh, ending horror movie? Oh, it's definitely in the running for sure. I mean, like probably not best horror movie ever. Probably not. Probably not even top ten. But best ending that you don't get more downer than that dude like that's it that what that's that's bar bar none the best that's your gold standard i think for how you end a, a movie with a fucked up ending that and buried i think are that's that's what you aim for when you want to do endings like this yeah like like i said if you google search depressing endings mm-hmm. this is one of the top ones uh this um, ending doesn't give up fuck about your emotions and we'll talk about this ending because it's very important about like how this came to be but that's the end of the movie guys so the only other thing i want to talk about before we go into our trivia is uh do you think norton survived i kind of think he does i, don't know. I kind of think he does well okay uh i don't know if it's in your notes or not but the other the second truck they wanted to film yeah that is yeah okay yeah we'll talk about it but I, I think Norton survives. Just on yeah, based probably. on the theatrical cut of this. I think he does. I don't know what he does after that. I think he maybe gets to a car and he's still sitting there, but I think he survives. And I think does this movie does it mean anything for the characters that do survive and the ones that don't? I mean I, I the woman with kids at home I think is there just to be the smack in the face at the end. But Oh yeah, for sure. <clears throat> but I mean, like the soldier dude getting killed after being sacrificed and, you know, certain people, I feel like they were trying to make a statement. Because I realized what the statement was. Because when the woman with kids at home asked for his help to go home and rescue her kids, he says, no, I have to worry about my own son. And he picks him up, like, kind of like Billy Zane in Titanic when he finds that little girl. And he's like, please let me on the lifeboat. I have a kid. That kind of thing. I'm all mm. she has. I feel like that's kind of what he's doing here. He's kind of using his son as, like, an excuse. Whereas if he just would have went with her, he probably would have been totally fine. And... In- his son would still be alive. That's what I think. So let's talk trivia. Uh, Stephen King said himself that he was actually like genuinely frightened by the uh, by this adaptation of his novel. Uh, and Frank Darabont said that's the happiest moment of his career is making Stephen I King happy. I would be too. Uh, let's talk about The Walking Dead. You know, we mentioned them all. So here's all we the characters to. that appear in The Walking Dead in this movie. Jeffrey DeMunn, Melissa McBride, okay. Lori Holden... Which Juan, those are the main three. Yeah. Juan Gabriel Perea, Perea. Don't know who that is. Sam Witwer and Tiffany Morgan. I don't know who those are either, but that's that's those six those people are. that were in The Walking Dead. Oh, Sam Witwer is the uh, creepy looking soldier guy with the punchable face. Oh, okay. Uh, Frank Darabont was originally offered thirty million dollars just to be a producer. Uh, I'm sorry, by a producer to make this film. Uh, oh. But the problem is they wanted him because he was also the screenwriter. They wanted him to change the ending. Oh, fuck that. So he said, look, I'll make the movie under the condition that no matter what, you don't get to change this ending. I'll take even less of a budget, which he ended up with an $18 million budget. So around half. And they're like, you know what? That's fine. If you want to do it for half, you can keep your ending. Uh, The ending is uh, different from Stephen King's uh, novella. uh, Because in the book, it's... It's it's, a lot more... It's not quite as like... It's like more mysterious it's ambiguous it? yeah it's it's written in first person and, and thomas Shane's character is david uh he imagines it uh basically the ending as a distant possibility uh he says you know there's three bullets and uh there's four people because uh 
Dale doesn't appear in the car in the in the book. Oh. But he's basically writing a journal during the novella, and he ends his journal and leaves it in the re- uh, in the grocery store. Um, before the car. Oh, I'm sorry. They stop at a restaurant and okay. he leaves the journal there, and then it's implied that he they run out of gas uh, somewhere down the road. Uh, Darabont thought that was too ambiguous. He's like, you know, what? I want to see what actually happens in the climax. And uh, in the in the DVD commentary, uh, Stephen King endorses Darabont for it and said that uh, he wishes he would have thought of that. Yeah. But I kind of like the idea of it being ambiguous too. Like, they, I kind of want to read this novella. I've never read it. But... My mom has actually, but I haven't. I kind of like my the mom idea was of, big of journal King entries. Fan. I think that's kind of cool. Like my mom showed me like it when I was like six. <laughs> I think my mom hates me. <laughs> so <laughs> now that I think about we, that. We, you already mentioned it, but yeah, uh, when the rescue trucks come at the end, Frank Darabont wanted a second truck that was going to show all the people from the market. Yeah, like all the people that got getting left rescued. The store. Yeah, which again would have been another slap in his face. Yeah, I don't know character. if I could have handled that. That would have been. I think just seeing Norton and maybe like the crazy redneck dude yeah. would have been enough. That would have been great. But uh, unfortunately, most of the by the time they wanted to do this, everybody else. I kind of went on to do other movies. So oh, he, like all the actors were done. Yeah, they were they were on new mm-hmm. films and TV shows. They couldn't do it. Uh, this kind of explains Project Darrow. Uh, Frank Darabont originally had an opening scene showing basically uh, what happened to uh, make the portal open uh, and allow the creatures in. And uh, the guy that plays Norton was just like, you know, do you really need that scene? It's kind of unnecessary. And Darabont agreed. He was like, you know what? It's, it's, it is better to leave it a little more ambiguous, but... You know, we do get that that dialogue uh, between the soldiers. Yeah, and the, which you know, I kind of like that. Yeah, and that's enough. Wait, that was the guy that played Norton that suggested that. Yeah, way to go, him. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and again, I already talked about this. My last little note here is that this is uh, the game Half Life. The series Half Life is inspired by The Mist. Oh, yeah, yeah that's wow. That's and if you played very Half-Life, obvious after. Yeah, if you played Half Life, oh. it's pretty much beat by beat. <laughs> Uh, and that's it. That's uh, that's the mist. I don't really have any other notes on it. I mean, we can get into our silver linings. Uh, you want to go first? Or you want me to go first? Uh, I have two. Okay. Uh, they're but they are both kind of like again stretches. But I think because I have two, I can kind of vouch for this. Time. Okay. Um, so we found out that I mean, obviously, this wasn't something biblical. So yeah, they everybody can kind of rest at ease. The Not mist, the end of the world. At least in this city, it looks like the mist has been defeated. Yeah, you know, so uh, everyone's gonna be safe, I guess, is a, a relative kind of term. Uh, and also, I said, you know, well, the woman with kids got back to her kids just fine, and that's why it's not our lead character. It's a, not a necessarily silver lining for him. It's at least, you know, a good thing for her. And I think he's learned his lesson that to not be so like to be more open about uh, people, which I think his character kind of flirts with the whole movie. Yeah, between helping people and not. So that's that's my silver lining. And, uh, and again, he's got a long road ahead of him. So not only yeah. did he lose his wife and his son, but then he also killed his his to be girlfriend. <laughs> but what do you got? Uh, now this is going off a fan theory. Oh, okay. Norton lived. At least Norton made it out. So they technically I, they in both. In my lived. mind, Norton made it. They out. both live in. Uh, Norton certainly lost a whole lot less than yeah no yeah for sure than David. I mean David one, I mean glass half full he can go live that bachelor life now for real he can actually go to so, Hol- I mean, to to yeah. Hollywood and make those posters yeah, he can head out to L A he doesn't have to be in um, Maine making posters for I mean, he's Hollywood got films. the basis for one hell of a screenplay oh yeah no doubt for sure he's got a memoir that people are gonna want to read oh absolutely he's gonna be settled in terms of money after this so those are actually kind of black ending like lighting. yeah, like, wow, that's yeah kind of fucked up but, uh so we can, we can do a whole other podcast on those silver linings to our <laughs> so, silver linings so because this movie is obviously one of if not the most fucked up ending to a movie ever of ever we have to come back with something fun i'm gonna say the shawshank redemption you can't go wrong okay for, that's frank darabont's best movie it's one of if not the and best movie ever happy ending and a very fun like ending, every, yeah, for sure. Well, I won't say everyone comes out on top of that movie, but I mean... It, you People know, come out. It comes out full mm-hmm. circle. For sure. Um, Mine's a stretch. Okay. But I'm sticking with the whole aliens coming through portals thing. I'm going with the Avengers. Okay. A, it's a group of people what? fighting aliens you're, you're not getting no that come through me. portals. You're not getting no argument from me. Uh, 
so i guess that is it uh thank you for listening everybody to this episode please uh subscribe and rate leave us feedback on itunes uh go like our facebook page facebook.com slash silver linings playlist if you have a suggestion for a movie you'd like us to talk about that's got a fucked up a downer or a sad ending not uh, the mist again <laughs> yeah obviously episodes we haven't done yet but uh leave us a, a message on facebook or post on our wall and let us know and we'll we'll definitely consider it so man the mist <laughs> i'm sad i'm exhausted yo you like good lord that movie is that ending I've seen is this rough. twice in the past like month and a half. I don't I've seen this see twice it. today. I don't need to see it again for a while. <laughs> oh man! And I had two people that had never seen this movie watch it with me while I was watching it today in preparation for this, and they were mad at me for <laughs> having shown it to them. Um, you know what we've got to do last week that we're going to do this week? We've got to get a clue for next oh. week's episode. So, Ooh. do you have a clue for next week's episode? Clue for next week. Let's go with Beware of Kevin. <laughs> okay. Uh, so thank you again for listening, everybody. Please tune in next week. Uh, share this our show with your friends if you enjoy what we do here. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and let you know that these next two are, are pretty great. The last two episodes we got for, oh, uh, so wonderful. for October. You don't want to miss them. So, again, thank you for listening, everybody. And as always... Excelsior. Excelsior.